I've walked by this building for ever since it was built, wondering, what do they do there? What goes on there? Yeah. yeah, we actually just gave all of our guards who are out on the sidewalk little cards to hand out. Because, I, I mean, this is an awesome organization with an incredible mission. And we were founded about uh, 35 years ago by members of Congress, um, primarily members who were vets of either World War II or the Korean War and who had seen combat. And they were seized with the idea that we as a country needed a place that was dedicated to the study of peace, of how do you prevent and resolve violent conflict and sustain peace, much like we have all of these military academies that train people in how to wage war successfully, there needed to be a place on how do you wage peace successfully. And it actually merged or, or converged with citizen activists who were advocating for the same thing. And so it was, it's a wonderful, our founding is, is a wonderful example of how change happens in the United States, where you have congressional legislative action and you have citizen action and it came together and it formed U.S. Institute of Peace. And we, our original mandate was uh, more focused on delivering on our mission of preventing and resolving violent conflict and sustaining peace uh, with an educational focus. And so we spent about the first decade of our existence really working with um, universities, community colleges around the country on the kind of training and education that helped people understand very specifically what are the practical skills for preventing and resolving violent conflict. It's things like how do you, how do you have dialogues, negotiations, uh, facilitated agreements, how do you map and analyze conflict. And then with the, with the end of the Cold War, uh, we really began responding to the need to apply those skills in places around the world. And so we now have teams um, in about 12 hotspot countries uh, where we work with citizens, um, you know, grassroots up and government level down on how to prevent and resolve violent conflict. Um, so we combine the, the kind of research, training, education, policy recommendations for our government with very practical applications. Um, we very firmly believe that peace is very possible. It's sometimes when you read the paper, it doesn't seem that way, but peace is very possible. It's absolutely essential for our security and for international security, and it's very practical. Um, that it, it's something that you do, that you practice. There's a great quote as you enter the building from Eleanor Roosevelt that says, it's not enough just to talk about peace that you have to believe in it. And it's not enough just to believe in it, but you have to act. And so this is very much a place about acting on that belief. So I'm delighted to hear your questions. Hi, I'm Carl. Hi, Carl. Can you talk about who or what inspired you to pursue a career dedicated to the cause of alleviating suffering and building healthy communities? So my personal pathway uh, took a very unexpected turn after pursuing both an undergrad and graduate degree in English literature it's in Stanford. I was in your sort of your neighborhood. Um, I ended up taking a trip to Nepal where I ended up by chance having an opportunity to teach there uh, for a couple of years, where it just changed. So this is immediately after graduation. And it, you know, in those years, I certainly didn't have the chance to travel, I think, as much as many of you have had the chance to do to places that are so different from here. But that two and a half years in Nepal really changed my life and it changed my direction and I became um, very involved with the Tibetan refugees and when I came back I, I began pursuing a very different pathway and uh, have spent uh, you know the last 30 some years working primarily in places that have been destroyed by conflict or natural disaster which led me to this 
institution, which was an opportunity to not just respond to conflict, but try to get ahead of it, to prevent it, and be very focused on what does that look like. But the, the, the big takeaway that you should get from that is that you will have no idea where your pathway goes, but you need to be open to the unexpected. I was just taking a trip to go trek in Nepal. I was going to be an English professor. Hi, my name is Sienna. And after working with Mercy Corps for 14 years and building it into a globally respected organization, I'm curious if you could speak about what leadership skills you've learned during that process. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, many, uh, with, and, I, and one is always learning every day. Um, I learn new things about how to try to do a better job. But probably the most important is, um, is just being a really good listener. That there's so much information and wisdom that comes from all parts of the organization. That if you, if you don't have your ear open to hear what's being said, you'll, you'll miss opportunities to, to really unleash the creative powers of the people on your team. Hi, I'm Noah. What are the necessary qualities you have to have in order to be an effective agent of change in a foreign country with a different culture? You know, one of the things that becomes very clear when you do this kind of work is that change will happen because of the power of the people in that community in that country. And that what our most useful role is, is helping support them in ways that help them to do that more effectively. Information, tools, skills, connecting them to larger communities, but that the, the agents of change really have to be those community members. So that's a little different kind of uh, way of answering. It's a really important question, and, and I would answer it by saying that you learn that the agents of change are those community members. Our, it's, a, it's a really important lesson for policymakers who think that we can go in and impose change, and that just really never works out that well. Hi, my name is Zach. As juniors, our class went to South Africa last summer and were quickly immersed in a completely Zach? different culture. Yeah. Who did you meet in South Africa, juniors? Desmond Tutu. Yeah, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Wow. Peter, Peter Harris, Harris author. He, he wrote a book uh, on the Del Mar. He defended the Del Mas Four during yes. the apartheid years. Great trip. Great opportunities. So we were quickly immersed in this completely different culture. I know for myself, I tried to bring back what I learned about community from that culture. I was wondering, during your time overseas in Kazakhstan and Nepal, working for the Mercy Corps, were there any aspects of those cultures that you wanted to bring back? And if so, what were they? Uh. Well, living in Nepal just completely changed my life. I mean, you know, I, I was basically living like a Peace Corps volunteer, so very embedded in the community. And, I, you know, I think for me it was an opportunity to get outside of um, some of the expectations and the, the, the ways that we're that were raised here in this country. It's, it's a very spiritual country. Um, people live very close to that kind of inspiration in their life. And uh, it, 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 it opened things up for me. And I've definitely carried that around uh, inside me every day ever since then. And I hope everybody had a chance to read Desmond Tutu's Book of Joy with the Dalai Lama. I really commend you to that if you've already had a chance to meet him. One of the best things that we have a chance to do is we work with a network of youth leaders around uh, various conflict countries, um, youth leaders who have chosen not pathways of violence but to be peace builders in their communities. And they are doing some pretty amazing, inspirational things, you know, in places like uh, northern Uganda, northern Nigeria, Somalia, Sudan, Syria. Many of them are displaced as refugees or internally displaced. But we bring about 30 of them every year to Dharamsala to have a two-day dialogue with the Dalai Lama. 
um, because you know to be that kind of a peace builder, you have to have peace within as well. And it's a way to give them greater resilience and greater support. And um, the Dalai Lama cites his friendship with Desmond Tutu frequently, and I think that book really captures it, if you've had a chance to speak with the author. Yeah, but it's the power of, you know, fresh eyes and young energy and that, you know, undiluted belief that you can make a difference in the world that is so powerful with these youth leaders. Hi, I'm Cyrus. In an interview with Biz Women Journal, you spoke about your job at the U.S. Institute of Peace, saying, the shift to U.S. Institute of Peace is really about getting upstream from the crisis. Being able to keep conflicts from becoming violent means that we could hopefully lessen the number of crises that devastate people's lives and require global response. What do you see as the primary sources of conflict and most often cause them to become violent? You've really done your homework well. Um, you know, what we've seen, so, so I spent a lot of years doing humanitarian response work. And a decade ago, 80% of humanitarian assistance went to victims of natural disasters. So a decade later, 80% of global humanitarian assistance goes to victims of violent conflict. And we have seen um, an uptick in violent conflict that pushes what is now an historic level of people, about 70 million people, 70 million, million people are out of their houses either as refugees or internally displaced. But where, so, what, so people talk a lot about the refugee crisis, I'm sure you've engaged in that conversation, but what we really have is a crisis of countries that cannot or will not take care of their people, where the governments are illegitimate in the eyes of their own citizens, that they're often repressive and terrible to their people, or they just don't have the, the capacity to provide basic services. And if you look at you know, that arc of countries that are basically on fire, Somalia, South Sudan, Syria, Libya, um, you know, they're all on the spectrum of what we call fragility, of, of you know, and it, I could go on with this list of countries. Um, that's the biggest source of conflict. It's where communities and countries cannot manage a conflict and therefore it becomes violent. Because we've seen in our own country, I mean, conflict is always going to exist. I mean, as, wherever you have more than one person, you're, even with only one person, you'll probably have conflict. But the question is, can you manage it so that it becomes productive and even transformative. And we see that in our own country, how conflicts have led to transformative change, the women's movement, the environmental movement, civil rights movement, you know, it's transformative. It changes in a really positive way who we are as a country. But when you don't have that, that kind of a system that can manage disagreements, that's when it goes violent and then it rips a place apart. And that's the kind of conflict that we're, and the kind of violence that is on the rise globally right now. Hi, my name's Sage. And we read that you were the chair of the Sphere Management Committee that was concerned with improving the effectiveness and accountability of NGOs. Could you talk about why you were attracted to that work and about the elements of an effective organization and what factors cause them to fail? So that was um, probably about 20 plus years ago. And it was, it was at a time where humanitarian assistance was uh, moving from being volunteers wanting to do good to professionals wanting to do better. And part of the Sphere Management Committee effort was to create uh, goals and standards that all the humanitarian actors adhered to. Um, and it was part of, of really an important professionalization of humanitarian assistance because, which has continued on in different realms beyond just core standards. But you know, with a lot of good attention, intentions, you can go to provide help to a community and 
not do help for them, you know, not just provide, you can actually harm them sometimes. Um, so it was about wanting to help that transition and do so at a more systemic level where you could really achieve change at scale by getting all the organizations signed up. Hi, I'm Ruby. In an interview with Minnesota Daily, you said, we need to engage at every level of society to build peace. We need to build peace from the bottom up as well as from the top down. Can you talk about why this dual approach is important and the consequence of not working from both directions? I am so impressed with this group. Um, this is a really key point because, you know, since particularly the end of the Cold War, we don't just live in the domain of diplomats anymore. We live in a multipolar, multi-stakeholder world where you can have the best peace accord in the world, but if it's not accepted by the multiple constituencies that may have been at war with each other, it won't last. And a George Mitchell, Senator George Mitchell, who was instrumental in negotiating uh, the Northern Ireland, the Belfast Accords, you know, he says the peace accord is the beginning. You know, when you get that signed agreement, that's when the work really begins. And you need to have an inclusive process that brings those who had the grievances into the solution. Um, so you need to work at the community level but they ultimately need to connect up to state or national or sometimes regional processes that create a more enduring peace. And it has to be inclusive. This is one of the core learnings. And often, who's not at the table are women and people who are affected by the conflict. So one of the things we do here at USIP is, pro is provide both the research that shows that to be true and work on the kind of processes that enable that to be practiced more, more broadly. Thank you. Hi, I'm Indigo. You also said, we live in a fragmented world, so preventing violent conflict requires understanding and working at the local level with civil society, tribal or religious leaders, for example, as well as the national level. Do you find that working at these different levels requires different skill sets to get things done? Yes, I do. I think you have to have different skill sets and different orientations. It's different to do a dialogue. In fact, we just had this conversation this morning. You need a different model of conducting a dialogue at a community level than you do if you're doing a state-to-state, -state, you know, track one, track 1 1.5. Do you all, you know, track one is government to government. Track 1.5 is government plus non-government. Those are different models, different skills, um, and often different orientations. You, you need a different kind of vocabulary and worldview often to operate really effectively at the state-to-state -state level than if you're working at a rural community level or in between. So that's some of the thing. Those are some of the skills and models and approaches and trainings that we work on and provide here at USIP. On March 22, 2017, you testified before the Senate Foreign Relation, Relations Company, excuse me, Committee, decreeing cuts in the foreign aid budget, budget proposed by President Trump. Can you talk about the consequences that you were concerned about that caused you to take such a strong position? Well, I am certainly not alone in that position. Um, what you might find interesting, but you've probably uncovered already, given the thoroughness of this group, is uh, some of the largest, most vocal proponents of a strong budget for diplomacy and development um, comes from the military. That the military understands that most of the issues, most of the problems that we face around the world will not ultimately be solved through military action. Um, they can do so much, at which point you need to have those other capabilities um, in full play. And we're seeing this in real time in places like Iraq, for example, or Syria, or you know, choose a conflict where military action cannot be, the, will not be the, the ultimate solution. And so we are much safer as a country. We are a much better partner 
when we have the ability to engage with the world through those civilian means, through diplomacy, with our development activities. Uh, it's a, it's a, an absolutely critical part of how we operate as a global, as a member of the global community. Hi, my name is Amy, and I was wondering if you could talk about the appropriate application of foreign aid so that it does not inadvertently disrupt or corrupt the cultures we are trying to help. That's a long answer. You could do a seminar on that. Um, and a lot of people continue to grapple with that and learn as, as we all proceed. I think one of the things that we've learned is these gigantic packages of aid where you put just huge amounts of money at once, where we saw in Afghanistan, for example. Um, often won't accomplish your goals because it, you, change, especially in a conflict environment, um, is often generational. And you need to have the time and the patience to let countries and communities and people heal and then move with the, as being the prime actors, to your question. Um, where, it becomes, where it can become really corrupting and it, it is when we go in with our agenda um, and try to dictate a pathway, and it, it often is not very effective either. I think that's been the core strand of learning in the development world. Do you have an alternative to that? I mean, we know what's, what you shouldn't do. I, you know, the, the, it, it, it sounds really easy, but it goes to being a good manager. You have to be prepared to listen, uh, to be prepared to provide those elements that are most helpful, depending on what the context and what the, what the problem is. So, for example, in, I, was just in, um, uh, I was just in Nigeria, and you know, they have, it's a very wealthy country, uh, they have uh, all the potential in the world economically and richness of human capital, but they are roiled in all of these conflicts all the time. They need almost everything, food, water. I mean, there was the famine, fear, um, education, agricultural development. So they've asked for, and the U.S. provides support in all those realms. But all of that gets overtaken over and over again because of the conflicts, the Boko Haram conflict, the conflict between the, har the herders and the farmers. So what, what they really need and what the communities are asking for is they want a better government. They want a government that isn't corrupt. They want a government that is going to be responsive with the kind of policies that help solve the herder farmer grievances. So we can't go in and do that for them, but we can take a combination of our diplomatic pressures and some of our technical assistance to help pr the, the communities demand it and some solution sets for how to provide that where there is the political will. Um, ultimately, the partner you need a partner for change to have development assistance be effective. They have to see a pathway that they want to, to, to follow. More responding than directing. Yeah. Hello, my name is Will. Uh, recently, you wrote an article for foreignpolicy.com entitled, Can Anything Save the Israeli-Palestinian Peace Process? The article ended by stating that both sides of the conflict believed that there was a, quote, crucial need for U.S. government leadership in helping both sides focus again on the way forward. Can you talk about why you feel that the U.S. Uh, is seen to have such a crucial role in world peacekeeping and whether you think this administration diminished uh, the importance of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process? So I think you're referring to an article that I wrote two years ago following a visit that I, that I took there where um, you know, one of the, so for many, many years, this institute has had a focus on what used to be known as, as uh, uh, the, the, the Middle East conflict, 
when that was the conflict. Um, you know, we now, of course, have a region that has five or six conflicts that are demanding of attention and of concern. So one of the issues that I was quite attuned to during that visit is that there just wasn't a lot of attention being paid. And there was a generation that was growing up that no longer had confidence in the Oslo process, which was what set the peace terms 20 years ago. And so if you've spent your whole life seeing something not work, that's when, if you remember a couple years ago, these knife attacks were starting to happen. It's now a completely different landscape, of course. Um, but to the core of your question, the U.S. has been, for the last 20 plus or longer, I, you, know, you could argue 70 years, we have been a leader on the world stage, um, propelled, I would argue, by the values that we support, that we espouse, that we represent. And that has been the basis for what people talk about as the international world order. I'm sure you've heard talked about this. That is, it's a values-based order. Um, and so, and it's been upheld chief among others, the United States. Um, and that, that, is an, that is a whole conversation that's underway right now. Is that world order still holding? Is the US still the indispensable nation for that? And we're at a real pivot point um, at, that um, you know, I commend all of you to pay close attention to and be a part of a future that reaffirms those core values, which are you know, fundamentally about people's you know, liberty and freedom to express yourselves and you know, all the things that we take for granted that many other people in other countries do not have an opportunity to, to experience. It's sort of a long answer, but both context on that article and I, I hope an answer to your question. They're big, they're, we're asking you big questions. Yes, so. you are, you are. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but I'm impressed that you're all, do you, do you do this level on research for each of your meetings? You've been prepping for a while. Uh, this is impressive. <laughs> and, uh, for a while and still prepping. Right? Yeah, well yeah. good for you all. This is great. You're, you, know, you know, it's interesting, I'm sure all the people with whom you're meeting and asking you know, it, 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 it underscores one, everything you do or say or write lives on forever, because you guys are pulling articles off the like, oh, did I write that? And two, um, you know, it's an opportunity for those of us who are rushing all around all the time to, you know, kind of have to step back and think a bit. So you know, you, you take it as you, you all are doing a service to people here in Washington. Thank you very much for that. Hi, I'm Priyanka. We recently interviewed former Secretary of State George Shultz, who said that there are some issues that can only be worked at but never solved. Do you have conflicts and issues that fall into this category, and are there different protocols for these kinds of conflicts? Well, it's interesting because just this morning I was talking to some people who were noting an issue, and I said, you know what, we're never going to solve that issue, you're just going to manage it. And that was referring to, you know, organizational issues, you know, not big country conflicts. But what it, what it speaks to, and by the way, there's the George Schultz Great Hall that I hope you have a chance to see. You should take your picture and send it to him, because he loves the Great Hall, seriously. And you can send him the picture and say that you had a chance to visit it. Um, he's been a big, big supporter of USIP. But what it speaks to is what I said earlier about there will always be conflicts. There will always be conflicts of one sort or another, and often it's just making sure that you have the skills, the systems, uh, and the commitment to manage it. Um, there's, I, I think that's different than saying, can you solve you know, the Northern Ireland conflict? Can you solve the Syrian conflict? Yes, you can solve. Peace is very possible. Peace is possible. Conflict resolution is always going to be a requirement. And I would just separate those things out. Hi, I'm Jordan. Um, we have spent a lot of time in class reading about and discussing the ways in which people participate in a democracy that goes simply beyond simply voting. Now, more than ever, it seems that our country needs active and engaged citizens. 
Can you talk a bit about what you think the responsibilities are of an engaged citizen? Oh, so great. Um, yes, that is so important uh, that you, 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 so first of all, and I'm sure you all can answer this even better than I can, but you know, you need to be knowledgeable. You have to, under, you have to go behind the tweets and the WhatsApp and whatever, whatever, to understand what's the real issue that you're maybe voting on um, and understand the deeper, more complicated story. I think you need to talk to people who disagree with you. Um, th that we need to understand there's sometimes reasons that people are holding different views. And this is a, this is a real fundamental of peace building. You have to talk to those people so that you can understand and come to understandings that encompass a greater whole. Um, you have to, you have to, all the ways in which, you, you know, a community is built through people doing things, having ideas, taking initiatives, you have to be active. Um, it's way beyond just voting. And this is actually, it's not what you're asking, but, you know, there's been a emphasis in some of our foreign assistance uh, on getting countries to hold an election. And elections are the least of it, in my opinion. There's a lot of other factors that create a peaceful, representative democracy that need to happen before elections. Elections often just crystallize people's differences. And so engaged citizenry is that much larger set of actions. That was a beautiful answer. I Great want to question. pause for a minute. Um, what have you heard so far that has struck you that she said? Okay. Let's, uh, okay, right over here. Uh, earlier, you said something akin to, or you were talking about how you could have the best peace accord in the world that was figured out perfectly, but it won't last unless you have a diversity of opinions that are backing it up and you have multiple viewpoints on the issue because then people will splinter after the fact. And that's been a pretty common theme throughout so, uh, our interviews that we've done so far, specifically when we interviewed Sean O'Keefe, who was a former director of NASA and Secretary of the Navy, and Milan Bevere. They both talked about the importance of including more diversity in our politics and our decisions, and I think that's really good that the head of the uh, peace industry, or I'm sorry, I forget the acronym, but uh, the head peace of Peace industry works. Okay. We'll be an industry. <laughs> We, we actually, I'll d uh, just quickly say that three years ago we spun out a 501c3, a nonprofit, with our data media technology work called Peace Tech Lab. And their aspiration is to create an industrial peace complex using technology. So you were channeling that, <laughs> clearly. Um, I liked when you said that peace is possible. I mean, it's such a simple statement, but I mean, everything behind it is so complex, and you just look at any news site, and it's just so many bad things are happening, and so many conflicts and wars, and there's just so much death, and then, I mean, to hear someone with um, your credibility say, peace is possible, it's really nice and refreshing to hear. There are a lot of, there are a lot of terrible conflicts that dominated the news when I was growing up, right, that you don't hear about anymore. Though they, they do end, but what we forget is that it, it takes a long time, and especially now that you've got places like Syria complicated by all the international actors that are in there, and what we see is they're lasting longer, but, but it is very possible. Um, I really liked when you acknowledged our um, questions and what we're really doing here. I think it really reassured us. How I liked how you said that everyone's you know rushing around and being busy, but then it's nice to have just sit there and think, and that reassured us what we're doing over here. I think one thing I found really interesting was how um, kind of like Will said, and it's been a common theme in all of our interviews that uh, that the diversity that we have in our world is the key to finding peace. And yet, the difference of opinion is what causes conflict. And I, I found that, inf that uh, relationship really interesting in how we can use our differences to create a peaceful society as opposed to just fighting. Nice. Yes. As Will also said, we spoke to Milan Revere the other day. And she also said that you, cannot, you can't go somewhere and impose change. You have to go there and listen. And that does, didn't really solidify it more for me, but it was really cool to hear you guys both say that as such strong women in positions of really high power. So thank you.
Um, it really struck me that you said that we can have peace even though there's still conflicts, that they don't necessarily have to turn violent because I think a lot of people when they hear peace, that means no conflicts whatsoever and that's not really, that there's always going to be conflicts that you said that, but you can still have peace. That really struck me. Yeah. I liked what you said about how when a country can't really cope with conflict or uh, function um, with differing opinions, then that could become violent or a violent society and that you have to talk with people you disagree with because I think that that, you know, maybe people underestimate it or don't really see it, but I think that that's definitely a really big problem in this country right now and it's just the fires building even more and, and I think that it needs to be addressed more. So. Yeah. Um, I really liked what you said about, um, you know, being a peace builder, like you have to have a sense of peace within. Um, I think that's definitely something that seems to be accurate. Um, and I also like what you said um, in regards to like getting such a, like getting so far in your English education before going to Nepal and kind of changing courses um, that like no matter, like you don't know where you're going to end up, but you have to be open to the unexpected. It kind of reminded me of something um, we heard during the Sean O'Keefe interview where he says that uh, you shouldn't turn down opportunities that you haven't been offered yet because you don't know how you're going to fit in yet. And I thought that was really inspiring to hear, especially since we're going off soon. Are you graduating? Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> can, can I just add one thing on this inner piece? Because I have really been seized, and it goes back to the Dalai Lama, with the, the neuroscience that is now clarifying the impact of conflict and social exclusion on your brain. And if you think of 50% of those 70 million people who are displaced by violent conflict are under the age of 15, many of whom will be in camps or out of their, you know, out of school for years. I mean, in Syria, they've already been out of their, you know, homes and schools for seven years. That has a profound impact on a whole generation. And so it, it, it increases the urgency and the imperative of our engaging in a way that can provide both assistance as well as the kind of move towards a resolution. Um, because it has global generational implications when people grow up in prolonged conflict and exposure to that sort of toxic stress on your neural pathways. And I'm curious, do you have anything you're curious about that these guys might answer? Turn the tables here a bit. Well, I'm curious about them. what is your impression. So what, what day are you in this? Like, We're, this is our fourth day of interviews. So you've had a chance to talk to a whole lot of people on the Hill and a different. So what are your big takeaways from, I mean, this is a, this is a very interesting time here in Washington. Um, it's, you know, I've lived here, I came here 20, two years ago uh, for, for one year. I was living in San Francisco. I had just gotten back from Kazakhstan, and I love the Bay Area. I had, it was where I was going to spend my life. And somebody said, this is a great opportunity. Come here for just a year. Do this thing for a year. And I came here for one year 22 years ago. Um, but, what, but what I found about Washington is that, unlike you know, terrible TV shows portray it, it's filled with really idealistic people who are mission driven and feel that you can make a different kind of difference here um, because of who else is here. It gets a really bad rap, the swamp, um, and uh, it's also in a kind of tumultuous time. So I'm curious what your takeaways are. What, what's your experience been here? Well, a lot of other people who, be, who we've um, interviewed, they ended up here um, in really unique ways, like you. And I think that says a lot about those kind of people. They were really passionate, and it was, it was random that they came here. And they came here because they cared about their country, and they wanted to make a change. And I think that really inspires me, that maybe this is an option. And, you know, just to stay open. That's what I've learned here. A, no. The people are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very similarly, I've learned that, you know, the people, 
leading our country are people. It's not just their opinions or the, you know, the, the two parties up there. There's so much complexity in so many levels and individuals who have goals and dreams and their own thoughts that are controlling what is going on. And I thought that was very inspiring also that, you know, that they're people and I'm a person. And if I'm passionate about this, that I could make a change too. That's great. Um, sort of going off of what you said, I noticed the first day before the rest of the group came and we started doing interviews when we viewed the monuments is seeing the monuments up close is much different than seeing them from far away. Just like the political process as a whole, like you said, it gets demonized almost every day in everything you read. But when you actually get to see it up close, just like the monuments, there's all these little intricacies that I never noticed in the pictures um, that you see in real life. And it's really been an eye-opening experience to see all the little details and complexities of the system in the real world and how, how much people are really trying to, to make it work. Um, I think it's really interesting just to be here and see like all these different people um, who are implementing the kind of structure and politics and government we read in our textbooks. Um, and I mean, it's kind of mind blowing. It's m so much more human than you think it is. Like when you read it, it just seems so dry. But then you come here and there's so much hope and passion for what the, the work everyone's doing. And it's really cool to see all that. I guess I just really respect the passion that you have for what you're doing because I think it really shows in everything you've said and what you're doing. Uh, yeah, um, so I've always been interested in the political process in general and a lot of things to do with government uh, and coming here kind of opens my eyes to a lot of different options I have because there's a lot more to the bureaucratic side and to the political side than you kind of see just by reading, because you hear a lot about just like the Congress people, the senators, the president, but it's really interesting to hear from people like you or from heads of NGOs or anything like that, because it kind of lets me realize there's a lot of different ways you can make an impact on the political process yep. uh, through many different organizations in many different ways. So that's really helpful for yep. my future. And that's, a really, that's really important. We, uh, we work with the Vital Voices Network uh -huh. for a lot of our for interviews. Uh, Lise Nelson, who's one of our superheroes, has connected us with all kinds of people who are doing amazing work. And I mean, I'm assuming you must know probably a, a great number of those people because of the work that you're doing. Well, I certainly know Milan, and I know Elise. Um, you know, Washington, at the end of it all, is not that big of a town, you know? It's just, it's, and it is filled with people. Anyone, anyone else who hasn't spoken? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I'm probably more interested in politics. Actually, I would say I'm more interested in politics than anything else. And so this is like my heaven, this whole trip so far. <laughs> and especially yesterday, um, sitting in the house and just like seeing like how like the voting process works and the debates, like it was like watch, watching a boxing match. <laughs> and it was like amazing. Great debate but, yesterday on the farm bill. Yeah. But oh, the farm it, I bill. Mean, it's like, it's refreshing and also mm -hmm. kind of frustrating because I see like all the tools that we have because of the way our system is built to make change that we want to happen. And I just see a country that is, at least currently is, is not using those tools efficiently. And I also see the tools that so far each president has, I mean not president, each politician has that, you know, if it weren't for, like we were talking about earlier about the conflict and the d differing opinions, that could be really used to its advantage. And so that's what I've noticed so far. And also that they're just people too. Which, yeah. there's a, I think there's a lot of excitement at a certain level at the potential of your generation. Like there's this whole sense of awake, reawakened, um, a reawakened sense of responsibility and, and willingness to engage. Uh, and so I think a lot of us take great hope in that. Um, again, no pressure, but uh, there, you know, because democracy is only as good as its citizens, absolutely. And um, so this, this you, you all are giving me great hope. We have an example in the room, Shannon over here, who is my colleague. She and her husband opened a ch the chapter of Indivisible in Santa Cruz, which is one of the most active in the Excellent. country. Excellent. 
and that took place after the election. That's the kind of stuff that excites me. That's, yeah. And we, uh, we're going to interview the Ezra Levin, who started that. Uh, and there's something like, right. how many chapters in the? There's at least five in every congressional district, and actually, if not more. So they're yeah. on the ground to make a difference. Well, that's peace building right there. Yeah. And, and it, what's interesting is it's a lot of um, people that have always considered themselves educated, engaged citizens, but not activists. So it's bringing a lot of people into action in a different way than they've ever experienced before, which is exciting for everybody involved. We just, actually, we're not seeing a lot of young people active in that way. So that's sort of the question of like, there's a lot of retired people involved, you know, and, um, but getting, you know, younger, getting the college campuses and things like that, getting people involved. Phoebe, did you have something you wanted to say? Well, a bird hoping, told me, he's around here somewhere, there he is. I was hoping to ask my question. Um, since a lot of us are seniors and we're about to graduate, um, I was wondering if you had any advice for us not knowing what to expect from the college experience or just the rest of our lives. <laughs> you know, I remember how anxious I was. It, you know, especially making the transition. You go from a place that you know well and the people you know well and often to much bigger environments. Um, you know, it's just the f finding what you are really passionate about and finding your voice and trying to let go of the anxiety. I used to agonize over what course I was gonna, like this course versus that course. And you know, at the, in the big scheme, that's not gonna matter. And try to, try to not sweat that stuff. I did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you for coming by.